Differential inference, a criminally underused tool. The style of this talk today is a bit different. Uh, this is kind of an experiment in giving a talk that combines code and math. And the whole talk is a live uh, PyTorch notebook. You'll see why this matters as we go, but if you want to follow along, you can get it at srush prob talk on GitHub. As a preface, I want to note that the title of this talk comes from a blog post from 2009 from Justin Donkey. In it, he notes how strange it is that we don't use auto differentiation more in machine learning, uh, an observation that uh, seems obvious in retrospect. Um, at the time, though, he said uh, it is bizarre that the main technical contribution of so many papers seems to be something that computers can do for us automatically. We would be better off just considering autodiff part of the optimization procedure and directly plugging in the objective function. In my opinion, this is actually harmful to the field to, to not do this. Um, obviously, we've come around on auto differentiation, um, but today's talk is kind of noting that we mostly use it for parameters. And I still feel that differential inference is underused. And when we talk about using differentiation to perform uh, kind of complex probabilistic inference, it still feels like there could be much more said and done to make these tools effective in practical use. Um, so today's talk revisits some papers. And uh, in particular, I want to note that it, it contains no new research at all. I'm, I'm not really even a researcher in this area. Um, my, my, my main work is in natural language processing. Uh, and so for this talk, I, I'm really just providing code for a differential approach to inference in Bayesian networks. Um, and um, I also want to note that I found work on autoconj from 2018 and work on probabilistic circuits uh, to be very helpful in kind of understanding the limits of these methods. Um, so if you're interested in some of the more advanced ideas in this talk, uh, check these and other works out. Um, but in practice, really what we're going to do today is a kind of slow didactic walkthrough of what differential inference means and how to apply it in modern uh, deep learning frameworks. I'm going to present the material by starting with some extremely elementary problems. Uh, and in fact, for this audience, it probably will seem a little bit too elementary, but stick with me and we'll get to some cool problems at the end of the talk. So we're going to start with an extremely simple problem. I have two coins. How many different ways can I place them? Obviously, there are four different ways. Tails, 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 heads, heads, tails, and heads, heads. Throughout the talk, we'll say tails is zero and heads is one. Now we're going to set up our problem by defining this in a vector representation. In particular, we're going to use vectors lambda 1 to represent coin 1 and lambda 2 to represent coin 2. For lambda 1, setting it equal to delta sub 0 represents tails and delta sub 1 represents heads. We can write this in PyTorch using the one hot function. We're going to redefine this with a function called ovar or observed variable where ovar 2 0 represents an observation of tails 1 0 and ovar 2 1 is our representation of heads. We can also have coins whose values we do not know. For these coins, we'll set lambda 1 equal to the 1 vector. In PyTorch, this is simply producing a vector 1 which we do by defining a function LVAR that takes in the size of possibilities. So in the case of a coin, we'll return LVAR of size 2. In practice, we'll often be creating our lambdas of lambda coin 1 and lambda coin 2 by using this zero argument function. We can use these representations in our counting function f. f will take lambdas as arguments, 
and it will return the count over its inputs. So in the case here, the function is defined as lambda 1 sub 0, it being tails, times lambda 2 sub 0, it being tails, plus tails heads, heads tails, heads heads. We can write this as a PyTorch function by taking two arguments, Lcoin1 and Lcoin2, and then using broadcasting to multiply them together and sum out all four possibilities. Here, passing none into an index produces a dimension of size one, basically a blank view dimension to facilitate broadcasting. Using this, we can get the total number of arrangements of coins by passing in coin, which as you recall, is a one vector, and coin for the second argument. This will produce the sum over all possibilities, which is four below. Now, this function by itself is rather trivial, and most of the magic will come in by the fact that we can use this function to give us different properties about the underlying counting problem. So let's look at some of these properties. So the first is that we can pass in different arguments to the function to constrain various properties of the count. So for instance, if instead of passing in one vectors, we have pass in delta or ovars, then lambda two equals delta zero gives us the count, assuming that we've observed the second coin as tails. So we can see this by, if we make this assignment, the counting function returns lambda one plus lambda one, one. So the, the two possibilities for coin one being heads and tails. Now practically, this means that if we pass coin as the first argument, and tails of the second argument, we get the total number of arrangements with coin two equals tails. Now, from this, we can extend the idea to differential counting. If instead of passing in an observation, we instead utilize the original function, but take derivatives, we can get the count under any observation. So starting from our function f of lambda, if we take the derivative with respect to coin one being zero, being tails, we get out the same term as before. So lambda of the second coin being tails plus lambda of the second coin being heads. This comes from the fact that the function f is linear in each of its arguments. We can take advantage of this in PyTorch code by simply calling backward on the function we were given. So we pass in both of our LVAR coins and call backward, and then look at the gradient for coin one at position zero, we get this derivative. So in particular, we get the derivative of the function f with respect to coin one being tails telling us that the count under that constraint is that there are two possibilities. However, when we do this, for the same cost of computing the single derivative, we get the derivative with each of the arguments. So we also get the derivative constrained for coin two being tails and coin two being heads. This gives us this vector here which tells us under these constraints, there are two arrangements of coin one. Okay, so, so far this seems rather trivial, but let's look at a more complex example. So let's assume that our two coins depend on each other and that our choice for coin one constrains our choice for coin two. So if we place coin one as tails, we'll say coin two must be heads. If we place coin one as heads, we allow coin two to be either tails or heads. This gives us three different possible outputs where the choice of our second coin depends on our first. 
we can take this new process and write it as a function f. We've basically eliminated one of our terms, so now we simply have tails heads, heads tails, and heads heads. We can write this out in terms of PyTorch code, where we define a function f that again takes two coins as its arguments. It defines the first case of choosing tails and forcing coin two to be heads. Under the second case, we get a sum over the two different possibilities for what coin two will choose as its output. We return the sum of these two cases. Under this, we can constrain the number of ways the coins can land. So in particular, if we define two unknown coins, coin one and coin two, and call f, we get back that there are three total possibilities. However, if we take a derivative of this function and look at the gradient with respect to coin one, we get that if coin one is tails, there's only one case for coin two. If coin one is heads, there are two different possibilities for the output of coin two. We can also combine both of these operations. Here, we assume we know the value of coin one, say we know its value is tails, then this term is zero, so we get zero as the output of our derivative, saying that there is no possibility that both coins can be tails. However, if coin one is tails, and then we allow coin two to be either, then there is one possibility for it also being tails and us having a valid output of this system. Great, so that's mainly the idea that we're gonna use throughout the talk. Let's summarize it briefly. We write down the generative process that we're interested in. In the first part of the talk, it was generating different counts or arrangements of coins. We can then constrain it by passing in observations that we have, and we can compute other constraints by computing derivatives. And in particular, uh, those might uh, be a whole lot of different constraints that we didn't know beforehand, giving us the ability to do kind of post hoc inference on our underlying system. So let's look at what this looks like in a probabilistic model. So in particular, when we do this form of differential inference on discrete distributions, we're going to specify the joint distribution. We're going to give a function that allows us to compute the joint probability of our variables. Once we've written down this function, we get several different properties basically for free. Each of these are going to assume some observed evidence. And from that evidence, we can compute the marginal probability of a given variable. We can compute the constrained joint probability under that observed evidence. And we can compute the conditional probability under that evidence. And this last term is going to be particularly useful for all sorts of different inference problems that we might want to write down. So let's again look at an elementary problem in conditional probability. We're gonna flip two fair coins. In this case, they'll be completely independent. We'll define a fair coin as just being a 50-50 vector defined here. From that, we're gonna define our function f to give us the probability of x1 and x2. The f function is gonna look nearly identical to how it did before when we were counting, except now instead of just having the lambda of coin one being tails times the lambda of coin two being tails, we're also gonna multiply in the probability of x1 tails jointly with x2 being tails. And we do that for each of the different possible events. In PyTorch, our code will look very similar as before. We still have the sum here over all possibilities. 
but now we multiply in the probability of heads and tails under this fair coin. Otherwise, these lambda variables are specified exactly as before. They can either be LVARs, which are latent, or OVARs, which have an observation. This function gives us, by itself, a way to compute the joint probability under observations. If we observe that coin 1 is heads and coin 2 is tails, we can get the joint probability by just passing them in to our function f. Here heads and tails are just the delta vectors that we saw in the first part of the talk. We can also easily compute the marginal probability under some observation. If we're interested in probability of the second coin being tails, we can pass in two arguments to our function and get this probability back. For variables we'd like to marginalize out, in this case coin 1, we just pass them in as LVARs. For variables we want to observe, we pass them in as OVARs, here delta 0. We can easily see that this gives us the sum over all of the LVARs of the probability here of coin 1 being any var variable, and coin 2 being the observation we were given. In terms of code, all this means is that if we uh, pass in an OVAR for coin 1 and an observation for coin 2, we get back the marginal probability of that value. Starting from this same function, so this is the same function from the previous slide, we can also get a constrained version of the joint distribution. So here we can note that function f with these two inputs is going to be a sum over all the different dimensions of lambda. If we then take the derivative with respect to lambda 1, we get out each of the individual values of that sum. So we pull out the first value of that sum to get probability x1 equals 0, and we can pull out the second value of that sum to get probability x1 equals 1. So this is nice, particularly when we have a large sample space, that just by computing these derivatives together, we get back all of the different values of x1 under the observation of x2. Now, practically, this just looks like passing in two arguments to the function f, one with uh, a latent uh, a variable and the other with an observed variable and then calling backward. From this we can get out that these constrained joint probabilities for x1 equals 0 and x1 equals 1 are simply 25 percent. Now what's nice is that from these two terms we can compute conditional probabilities under our model. So here we're simply going to apply Bayes rule and note that the probability of x1 conditioned on x2 under some observation is equivalent to the constrained joint divided by the constrained marginal. These are the two terms that we computed in the last two slides. One of them we computed with a derivative, and the other we computed by passing in uh, the right combination of LVARs and OVARs, deltas and 1s. This tells us that if we want the conditional, we just need f prime divided by f. Even better, we can use the log trick to get this term directly in an autodifferentiation system. So we note that the log of f, its derivative, is the derivative divided by f. So if we substitute in 1 and delta sub 1 divided by f of 1 comma delta sub 1, this will give us back the conditional probability x condition on x2 equals 1. Really, all this is saying is that if we want the conditional probabilities, we do exactly what we did before, but we simply take a log. So if we want the conditional probability of x1 conditioned on x2 being heads, we simply pass in the variables of interest, we take a log, and then we call backwards. Now, <laughs> this uh, little bit of code here um, looks pretty short, uh, 
But in some sense, this is kind of the punchline of the talk. Um, often when learning discrete probability, there are all sorts of different terminologies you learn, uh, including various ways of using Bayes' rule and belief propagation and all sorts of complex ideas. And for many problems in modern software systems, it really just corresponds to taking a log and calling backward. If you've correctly specified your generative model here in F, you can get a lot of extra information just by calling log and backwards and using that to do your inference for you. We didn't really have to do anything fancy or involve any sort of kind of probabilistic programming. We just kind of utilized the tools that we might be using already for parameter estimation. So let's look at this in some more basic examples and then we can move on to some more complex use cases. Um, so for this problem, um, I want to consider a variant of the conditional coin problem that we saw before. Here, instead of placing our coins, we're going to first flip a coin and then conditioned on its value, we either place the second coin as heads or we flip it again. We can write this in code with a slight variant of what we've done so far. This line here corresponds to the flip of coin one. We're just multiplying the probability of heads and tails by their lambda variable lambda one. If the coin is tails, we then simply place the second coin down as heads. If it's heads, we then flip the second coin and we multiply the probability of this flip by the probability of coin one being flipped as heads. As before, our return is simply the sum of all of our different cases under this joint probability model. Now from this, we can compute um, some terms of interest. So in particular, uh, we can use the following code to compute a marginal probability over x1 and x2. Okay, um, so those examples were a bit basic. Let's look at some fancier coins. So we can go back to our first example. Here we flip coin one, and if it's tails, we just place coin two as heads. If it's heads, we flip coin two. We can construct the f function by simply writing out this generative process in code. We first flip coin one. This multiplies the probability of each uh, heads and tails by the corresponding lambda variables. If it's tails, then we simply place coin one as heads by multiplying in its lambda. If it was heads, then we need to flip coin two. So that multiplies in the probability of heads and tails. And then we multiply the first flip landing on heads by either outcome of the second flip. Summing those up gives us a variable, which we can then use to construct our full joint probability term. Now, as before, we can calculate any sorts of uh, different marginal or conditional of this distribution. I think you get the idea at this point though, so let's just look at one particular example. We might want to compute the posterior or the conditional probability of x1 given an observation of x2. We do this by simply setting L coin 1 to be an L var, passing in coin 2 as an observation of tails, and then doing our magic trick, taking the log calling backwards, and then just looking at the gradient for coin one. If we plot this, we see that conditioned on being tails, coin one must have landed on heads. Let's look at a more complex example. Um, let's extend this by saying we first flip a fair coin. If it was heads, we roll a fair dice. Otherwise, we roll a weighted dice. To set this problem up, we need to construct a couple of distributions. Let's do that now. We um, define our dice LVAR as being an LVAR over six possible outcomes, 
we define a fair dice as being a uniform distribution and we define a weighted dice as weighting to a particular dice roll and otherwise being fair. From this, we can write out our generative process. Uh, this is going to look very similar to the one before, but let's go through it one more time just for clarity's sake. Here, we're going to first flip our fair coin. We have our L flip lambdas times the probability under the coin. If it was heads, we then roll a die. So we get the L die, these new lambda variables for the dice, times the fair die probabilities. And then we combine these two, where we multiply basically the lambdas that corresponded to heads with the fair dice roll. If it was tails, we do the same thing, just changing the fact that we're using a weighted dice for our L die second term. We finally add these together and sum up all the probabilities. From this, we can now compute probabilities over both our coins and our dice. We can compute the conditional probability of the dice conditioned on a particular choice for our coin. In this case, we see that if we flipped our coin and it landed on tails, then we get the weighted output that weights much more on rolling a four than other, any other variable. Conversely, if we condition on seeing a variable like five as our output, it's much more likely that we have landed on heads in our original problem. Um, so we get basically the conditional probability of our coin conditioned on that dice roll. Conversely, if we had rolled a three, which is what we are weighted towards, it was much more likely that we had flipped our coin to land on tails in the original flip. Finally, we can compute other properties with our data. One property we haven't discussed directly yet is computing the marginals over um, any of our possible outputs. Um, and we can do this just by conditioning on nothing. So if we apply Bayes' rule with no observations, call log backwards on, as I mentioned before, just LVARs, this will give us all the marginals for a given variable. So here we get the marginal probabilities over each of our dice rolls. And we see that even though it's a 50-50 chance of getting a weighted or a fair die, this still really weights the marginal probabilities of our dice roll to the particular value that was weighted in the original dice. So not that surprising, but gives you a sense of what you can calculate. Um, let's do one more problem, playing around with our coins and dice. Here we're going to do more complex probabilistic operations using our PyTorch code. So in particular, here we're going to be interested in uh, flipping two coins and counting up how many heads we get. So in particular, we're computing the sum of two discrete random variables. Now I don't have time to go over this now, but to compute the sum of random uh, variables, we're going to need to do a convolution between those two variables to get a new random variable C. In particular, we can write this up pretty easily in PyTorch using an unfolding and padding trick to define a 1D padded convolution between two vectors. We can then write um, our new function f, where we have a lambda c, which corresponds to the sum of two random variables occurring. So in particular, we'll just multiply this by all of the different ways of getting 0, 1, and 2 heads of our coins. If we write down this code, it's a simple application of our padded convolution. We simply compute the shapes of our two values. Um, we do a little rearranging and we multiply our new L count or lambda C variable by each of the different sums that could come up between the two random variables. Um, and the point being here is that we can then take this and utilize it in each of the ways we might be interested in. We can get the probability of each of the different counts occurring. So zero, one, and two with our coins. 
or we can do it a bit more complex with our dice. So here I'm calling the same function, calling log backwards to get the probabilities of interest. In this case, the marginal probability of each of the different counts. Um, and we can do this basically just by creating three latent variables, our two dice and a count variable that counts up the sums. And really the kind of punchline of this is that nothing that we did so far really required any kind of specialized probabilistic language. We're simply using PyTorch functions, we're using auto differentiation as written, and everything composes nicely with any other of the complex mathematical operations or parameters that you might have in a language like PyTorch. So for the last part of the talk, I want to go through some examples of real models. To make this interesting, I want to take three different models from undergraduate machine learning and describe how differential inference can be used to compute key terms in the model. So to begin with, let's talk about graphical models. So we'll start with a very simple BayesNet example. This is the example that's used on Wikipedia. We're going to assume three discrete random variables, sprinkler, rain, and whether the grass is wet. And each of these will be associated with a conditional probability table. So for rain, there'll be a 20% chance that it rains and an 80% chance that it doesn't. The first thing we want to do in our version of this model is to define these tables. We'll define a simple Bernoulli function, and then we'll define each of the different rows of these tables as PyTorch tensors. So rain is the prior that it rains, sprink rain is the conditional probabilities the sprinkler goes off if it's raining, uh, and wet will be the conditional probability of wet given a uh, sprinkler or rain. Now from these, we're going to construct our f function. We have three lambda variables, lambda rain, lambda sprinkler, and lambda wet. The first thing we do is multiply in the lambdas for rain by the prior probabilities of rain itself. We then do the same for the sprinkler lambdas, now multiplied by the sprinkler distribution and the event that it's raining. We finally combine everything together down here to compute the event that the grass is wet, take into account the event that its sprinklers are going off and it's raining. Summing this all up gives us a way to compute the joint probability of the full system. And my main point of this slide is just noting that this is really a direct translation of the graph in the first slide to PyTorch code. From this, we can then compute different probabilities. If we want the joint probability, we simply take an observation of each of the three random variables and compute the joint down here. If we want to compute a marginal, we can do this by passing in all latent variables and then calling log and backward. This particular marginal just tells us again that the probability that it's raining is 20%. The most interesting term, though, is this conditional inference term. If we want to know the probability that it's raining, conditioned on the grass being wet, we can simply pass in LVARs for rain and sprinkler and an observation for the grass being wet here. From this, we can then compute log and backwards, and this will give us the conditional probability of rain occurring. This gradient tells us that there is a 35% chance that it actually rained, conditioned on the grass being wet. And again, this is not so different than what we've seen previously, but I will note that we didn't have to do any kind of belief propagation or learn any types of new algorithms Everything here was computed just by exploiting auto differentiation. Next, let's look at an example in unsupervised learning. So Gaussian mixture models are often a classical example for teaching basic unsupervised learning. 
The assumption here is that we have four cluster centers represented by X's in the bottom picture. I generated this random data in the code above simply by starting from these four centers and generating random points from a Gaussian. The points that come from the top left are in blue, right purple, down left yellow, and bottom right green. Now this corresponds to a generative process where we first roll a dice to generate a class, and then we generate a point from the Gaussian associated with that class. When we write down our joint probability function, here we simply take into account which class we're in, represented by lambda class variables below. These get multiplied by the prior for that class. And then finally, we take into account the probability of generating that data from the mean associated with that class. So this looks very similar to our dice examples above to compute the probability of our distribution. In practice though, in common GMM settings, we don't actually know the distribution over the means. And so we have to learn this distribution while using it to infer what our current guess of what the clusters are. We do this using the expectation maximization algorithm, which is represented by these 10 lines of code, most of which are used for graphing. So I don't wanna go into the details of expectation maximization too much, but I wanna highlight these three lines of code here. What these lines are doing are computing lambda variables that correspond to every possible class for every possible one of our points below. So we have L bars for every one of our possible points, x dot shape zero, and every one of our classes. We then utilize these in our Gaussian mixture model in order to get the joint probability over all of our observations. And then we call log backwards, which gives us the conditional probability of originally being in each of the original classes conditioned on producing the observation that we see. And this term finally down here, q equals l class dot grad, gives us actually these conditional probabilities that we need. And those three steps together are the expectation part of the EM algorithm. By computing that conditional term, we've done everything we need to compute that part of the algorithm. We can then use that in the M step below in order to re-estimate our guess of the cluster centers. Now, that was a lot of math, but let's look at a fun uh, diagram. So here we have each of our guesses of the cluster centers to start with, as well as colors representing where we think each of the original data points lies. If we run this out at each step, we'll get a better estimate of our clustered centers and uh, get to something that's roughly similar to the original clusters that we started with, the end of the algorithm. So the final example is one of my favorite models, which is the hidden Markov model. The hidden Markov model uh, is a similar process to many of the models we've seen so far. The main distinction is that it uses a time series with a series of hidden states and observations. We can write it down in a few lines of PyTorch code. So we have a hidden Markov model, which takes as arguments lambda variables for observations and for our hidden states, as well as the parameters of the model. These parameters correspond to a transition, a mission, and prior matrix. The main body of this loop is this matrix multiplication here. This matrix multiplication is uh, some broadcasting tricks, but really just uh, the use of the lambdas for the hidden states times the prior times the lambdas for the observations and then the emission and the transition built in. Um, from this, we get a joint probability distribution over all of our states and hidden variables. Um, we then can produce in HMM 
uh, this particular code. It's not that readable, but it just says produce a simple HMM where the hidden states produce roughly their observation. And at every time step, they're allowed to move up or down roughly six uh, hidden states from where they are. So it'll be a little more clear with a graph. Once we have this, uh, we can then utilize um, auto differentiation to compute posterior inference. We do this with uh, these two lines here. So first we compute uh, latent variables for each of the hidden states and their state. We then run the HMM, call log backward, and we get an estimate of our hidden states. We can then use this to see how these hidden states change under different observations. So let's look at an example. So the way this works is that the y-axis represents our probability distribution over a given hidden state, and the x-axis represents the time series. And the way this starts is we start with only one observation. So an observation is right around this point here. Uh, and remember I said that the way the HMM works is it's allowed to transition just to its neighboring six states or so. So this uh, reflects the fact that it has to be at this point here, but it can, it can kind of burst out in both directions. Um, and the, the way this will work is that when I play it, I'm going to add some more observations in. So each time step, I add in some more observations, which constrains the model which constrains basically the, the marginal probabilities over hidden states that can occur at each period of time. Okay, so just to conclude, um, we've seen both some elementary examples and some more complex examples that use differential inference. Um, the main lesson of this talk is that Derivatives are interesting and you can try them for all sorts of things beyond learning. Um, and kind of the secondary message is that oftentimes uh, we don't need specialized algorithms or languages to compute things if we can kind of put them or utilize the tools that we've built and kind of optimized for. Uh, in particular, it can be very nice to borrow efficient implementations such as kind of GPU kernels developed for, for, for one task that can be applied to others. Um, maybe a more pejorative way of describing this talk is that basically all we've done is counting, but a lot of discrete probability is just kind of counting with style. The last thing I want to note is that uh, there's a lot, lot more in this space. Um, we can compute all sorts of other joint probabilities or kind of pairwise marginals. Uh, a lot of interesting ideas in continuous probability and using these kind of approaches for kind of generic uh, exponential family models. You can also apply these methods for entropies and divergences. Um, I've done some work on kind of overriding backprop for complex sampling or, or gumball distributions. Uh, and then there's a whole area of probabilistic circuits, which kind of studies and formalizes a lot of the methods that I've described. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, it's definitely a really cool area and there's a, a lot of stuff to learn. So, so much, much more than this talk. Um, so um, thank you so much for listening.